because there's a famous study in Brazil uh, during COVID-19 in which they wanted to show whether or not vitamin D would help with seriously ill uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And my area of expertise there is, is evaluating the study design of researches to find out how they should appropriately be applied. And in this particular study design was a rather poor one because they gave vitamin D extremely late and they gave the precursor to the precursor to the active vitamin D. So, but the important point here is that when you give a very large one-time dose of vitamin D, that kicks in that fail-safe mechanism and causes the, the body to break down that vitamin D. And in fact, the body will continue to break down vitamin D for 28 more days. So you end up actually having a lower vitamin D you know, a week later than what you would have had if you hadn't gotten vitamin D at all. And the other problem is that the tests that are used to test for serum vitamin D in the blood don't distinguish between the active vitamin D and that breakdown product. So these researchers in Brazil, when they tested the serum levels of these patients said, oh look, but we know that the bolus worked because their vitamin D levels in their blood were high. Whereas likely we have no way of knowing because it's not a very commonly used test to distinguish between those. What they actually were finding is the breakdown product was high, not mm. the active vitamin D level was high. And that is the only study that the US government has cited relating uh, in, in discussing vitamin D and COVID-19. So all the other studies that showed that vitamin D worked well uh, there were three studies out of Spain. There were several from France. There were a lot of different prospective studies that showed that vitamin D dramatically decreased COVID case rates, COVID hospitalizations, COVID death rates, COVID ICU rates. All of those things were dramatically reduced when people had vitamin D prior to getting COVID-19 or early on when they first got COVID-19. All of those were not even mentioned by these government organizations. And instead, they mentioned only this Brazilian study in which they gave this huge bolus dose that probably actually served to drop the vitamin D level. And actually, it wasn't even the, a particularly big dose. It was, uh, in the end, it was a, it only raised- 80,000 so very much. Yeah. And, 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 you know, if you throw a bucket of water on a blazing house fire, you don't then, and it doesn't put the house fire out. You don't then report water doesn't put out fires, right? It's it's just like that in a disease. If you act early, you can put the fire out. So this is a perfect indication of what we are saying, that despite the fact that none of the three of us would leap to the conclusion that public health authorities were actively somehow seeking not to control COVID, but in this case, to take all of the evidence that vitamin D positively affects COVID outcomes, prevents contraction of the disease, and positively affects outcomes in those who contract the disease, to focus on the study that fails to point to that result because of an experimental design flaw is what you would predict if you were looking to avoid this conclusion somehow, rather than to figure out what was going on and, and to navigate as best as possible. Yeah. So I, I want to I uh, stop you for a second because most people don't know anything really about vitamin D. Can we talk a little bit about normal, the normal interaction between human beings and vitamin D, how it is supposed to work, and then what modern life has done to that interaction, and then what implications it has for disease? Yeah, so I think it's worth probably, look, given that you, you, you look through the evolutionary lens, it's a very good way of looking at uh, what was vitamin D like you know, 10,000 years ago for, for us uh, as a species. Well, and actually there have been studies that have looked to try to find tribes that live that way now still and measure their serum levels. Uh, and they're great, really clever studies because they show us what our, our normal serum levels should be. And they're far, far higher than the levels that are currently defined as sufficient uh, in almost across the board. So we now, everybody who's part of this community is pretty much on board now with uh, um, a, a level that we would target for ourselves of 50 nanograms per milliliter using the American units. We use slightly different units here in Europe, so out by, which you have to multiply by two and a half. Um, and, yes. and that's because you're out, 
in, in the sun, uh, the summer sun all the time, getting exposed all day when it's sunny. Yeah, so what I talk about in my paper is the indoor lifestyle that we now have, which is absolutely not uh, what any of our predecessors had. And uh, the change was during the Industrial Revolution. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, virtually everyone in the world hunted, gathered, fished, or farmed. And so they were outside all day, including in the heat of the day. Now, it's important to know that vitamin D is not obtained from the sun just any time, anywhere. So uh, the rule of thumb is that if the sun is not at least 45 degrees above the horizon, you are not going to be able to get any vitamin D because the ozone in the, and this is, you know, historically, the ozone in the air, the natural uh, atmosphere is thick enough that the UVB rays don't get to you. So you can still get sunburn from the vitamin from the UVA rays, but the UVB rays that help provide vitamin D are not accessible to you. So what I tell people is, if you want to know if you're getting vitamin D or not, it's very simple. When you're outside, look at the ground at your shadow. If your shadow is not sharp and shorter than you are tall, you are not getting significant amounts of vitamin D. Oh, that's beautiful. So early morning outside is a wonderful time. Enjoy the birds, but you're not getting vitamin D. Yeah. Winter, middle of the day, if you live in a northern clime, you're not getting vitamin D. So it, this is, a, and there are actually a pretty easy to find uh, apps and uh, places you can go on the internet where you can find out what the angle of the sun is in your particular location to find out whether or not you can get vitamin D today or not. But at this time of year, there is no place in the United States that you can get vitamin D even in the middle of the day. So, it's also blocked so, by pollution as well. So it's worth knowing that you might, you might, all those conditions can be present and you still might not be getting enough. So that's true. Myself, yeah, air pollution. I take, I take a daily supplement every day all year round. I just take more in winter than I do in summer. So uh, I'm also now taking uh, daily supplements as, as is Heather. I'm, I'm, is uh, yeah. DMinder a good app for people to use? We have recommended it. Is yeah. it? Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah, and actually, yeah, Grass, is, Grassroots yeah. Health is a, a charity that was set up years ago, and they have some fantastic information for people. It's aimed at uh, promoting information. It's called Grassroots because they've actually been campaigning for more than 10 years to try and get vitamin D, similar here in the UK, and failing, and in the end decided we just have to educate people because the governments aren't, aren't going to uh, help us get this message out and are actively resisting it and have done for a decade. So uh, I want to point out the... Uh, what may still be subtle for people, which is in almost any ancestral circumstance, the amount of outdoor time during the summer would result in a production of sufficient vitamin D, which would then be stored in fat. And muscles. Yeah. Uh, stored in muscles actually, as well. A, yeah, it diffuses to all, so basically across your entire weight. So. All right. So the stuff stored in fat and muscle in particular has a special relevance because basically we have an ebb and flow of available food resources in ancestral circumstances. And so what you right. have is an elegant system for banking vitamin D when it's easy to produce because the sun is high um, and storing it in fat, which will therefore then be released as times are tougher, less is growing, and there's less sunlight. So the point is, it's a system that is built to maintain an equilibrium. And those of us who are supplementing to compensate for the fact that we are now spending much more time indoors, and I should point out that there are some uh, counterintuitive aspects of this, like uh, window glass blocks UV uh, radiation. And therefore, even if you're sitting in the window seat and it's uh, the sun is shining on you, it's not doing you any good in this regard. But sunscreen even, doesn't sun, take hardly any sunscreen at all to block the UVB rays as well. Sunscreen. And, uh, you know, I was realizing um, I'm a cyclist and I realized that even in the summer when it might be better to cycle with a shirt off, the cultural custom seems to be to wear a shirt and that that's probably something that we ought to revise, at least maybe shortening sleeves or something would allow more production. Correct. Um, the other thing we're seeing is that uh, the tropics, You'll notice if you look at COVID-19 rates, 
all throughout sub-Saharan Africa, you're just not finding the COVID-19 rates. And we were expecting it to be catastrophic yep. in sub-Saharan Africa because there's so little capacity. I lived for five years in a remote area of Ghana, and that is a very outdoor culture. The people basically use their huts as a place to shelter, to protect themselves from dangers at night when they are asleep. Yep. They spend the entire day outside. They eat outside. They visit outside. They cook outside. And in those areas, we're just not seeing COVID-19. I've got friends who work in hospitals and clinics there, and they're just not seeing it. And they should be. And I believe it's because their vitamin D levels are high. But in the areas that are uh, heavily Islamic or have other cultural reasons, so for instance, Cambodia and the Philippines, I know for a fact, and, and Brazil to a lesser extent, uh, light skin is highly valued. And so people tend to cover up. Uh, especially the women tend to be covered up. And that's where we're seeing the outbreaks along the equator. It's places where people are wearing a lot of clothing, even though they're in the tropics. So this is exactly what happened with MERS. Do you remember MERS? And of so course. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, and, it, and it was in, uh, when I did my literature review at the very beginning of the pandemic to look into uh, previous coronaviruses and seasonality, it was one of the first things that stood out. And it was targeting exactly the same people who wore full body clothing, didn't get exposed to the natural sunlight and were vitamin D deficient. Um, and when I did the causal inference analysis, we looked at, uh, I think it's probably the biggest causal inference analysis ever conducted. We looked at 1.4 million data points because there was so much data coming out at that time and examined the geographic patterns. The virus was in, Australia, for example, all over the, the centre of uh, the, the tropics, well before it hit Italy. And yet there were no severe outbreaks anywhere uh, until it hit Italy. All of the um, locations that suddenly started having severe outbreaks were happening north of, pretty much north of 40 degrees uh, north latitude. Uh, uh, a couple of exceptions were 30 degrees. So I, I noticed early in the pandemic, uh, the disaster that unfolded in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Um, right. Now, this is anomalous because, of course, Ecuador means equator. And so yeah. from the point of view of the angle of the sun, it's the perfect place to be. Guayaquil is on the coast. It's a low area, but it is very hot. And I don't know, maybe you know the answer, but I'm wondering if the prevalence of air conditioners and the tendency of people to be driven indoors by uh, heat might have contributed in Guayaquil compared to, for example, Quito, which is at high altitude and a much more temperate climate. Yeah. Um, well, where there are two factors that, that, that might be at play there. One is that there's uh, a genetic polymorphism, which, is, which interferes with vitamin D production in communities in Ecuador. Uh, I, I'm not the expert on that particular thing, but I'm in touch with one scientist who is. And the other explanation, as you've said, is in, in very hot weather. This happened actually in Arizona as well. I was very surprised to see rates going up in Arizona because the temperature was so high, but it was 40 degrees centigrade, which is, I don't know what, in Fahrenheit, like a billion Fahrenheit or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so, of course, in weather that's that hot, everybody goes straight to the mall, whereas and an air conditioning, you, you know, an air conditioned mall is perfect breeding ground for a, 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 an enveloped virus you know it can it's it's dry and it's cold and it and that's perfect uh, transmission time so. you were talking about italy earlier and italy's early uh a pandemic and the surprising thing with italy and you could see the same thing in korea that uh, in both italy and korea you would expect the biggest outbreaks to be in the biggest cities that have the international airports so you would expect Rome to be where the Italian outbreak was, but it wasn't. Instead, the Italian outbreak was up north and in the mountains. And the same thing happened in Korea. Seoul did not have the big outbreak. The big outbreak was in a smaller city. And people looked at the air pollution levels across those countries. And the air pollution was such that both Seoul and Rome, the way that they sit on the coast, the same thing happens with Houston, Texas. The, the currents push the air pollution inland. And so those areas don't have high air pollution, unlike California, where the California coast has the mountains right behind it. And 
California coast has serious air pollution right along the coast. And so they found that air pollution was a really high uh, risk factor for getting uh, COVID-19. And Wuhan has incredible problems with air pollution. So is the, uh, I guess maybe because they both point in the same direction, air pollution on the one hand blocks uh, UV radiation. Also, it will tend to drive people indoors where they have at least some insulation from it. Um, well, you, you're not, if you're, if you're living in a really heavily polluted city, there's really no way to get away from it. You know, that we're, we're uh, <laughs> talking about uh, people that don't necessarily have HIPAA air filters inside their houses. So, yeah. um, so the thing that's but, worth, worth um, uh, noting is that in Brazil, for example, that was one of the um, southern countries that seemed to start to have a, a, a big outbreak and did have a problem. Um, and that was surprising to people. Uh, Brazil actually has a very well documented vitamin D deficiency problem in its older communities, which of course, uh, you know, older people, they're, they're usually housebound or in a home and they're not out in the sun getting, uh, and, and there's a very um, high uh, population that are either black or mixed race uh, and, and, you know, that your skin colour will also block UV. So uh, early in the pandemic, when I was working with um, Dr. Karami and Dr. Byers, we, we predicted that we would see, if we were right, we would start seeing higher fatality rates in people with dark skin. And as that happened, they were being announced on the news. It was another data point that said we were right about this. And it was just incredibly hard to get people to take that seriously. Um, which is really well, that, sad. Yes, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a politically that, incorrect conclusion that there is something physiologically predisposing darker skinned people to risk from COVID. The irony is that recognize, I mean, the reason that dark skinned people have dark skin is to block UV radiation. Yeah. And so it is not surprising in an era where people have been moved around so they don't live where their ancestors were and their skin color does not necessarily match the amount of encounter with UV radiation that they have, that therefore being aware that it blocks vitamin D production and supplementing to compensate for it. And supplementing, I would point out, can mean, mean taking a vitamin D supplement. It can also mean minding the position of the sun and very actively banking vitamin D, which is, yeah. uh, to my way of thinking, a much better although I am now forced to supplement uh, with diet, uh, banking it from the sun would be a far superior mechanism. 